So I'm a neurobiologist and I'm interested in neurocircuits in the brain that regulate emotion. In particular, the kind of emotion that is associated with mood-related behaviors like fear, anxiety, despair. So I use rodent models, rats and mice, to study these and they are quite beautifully conserved across evolution. So our rodent cousins also experience anxiety and despair much like we do. And I use them as a model system to study these emotions. So serotonin is actually an evolutionally old molecule. It's been around for 3 billion years, long before there were neurons, long before there were nervous systems. It's an old conserved molecule. It's almost like moonlighting as a neurotransmitter. And yet within our nervous system, it does very interesting things. You know, if you talk to anyone like your grandmother or an aunt or someone, they will tell you that early life experience has profound effects on the kind of behavior you will show as an adult. And so that's not really new in a sense. We've known that from psychology for a long time, from epidemiological studies, that early adversity is a common risk factor for all psychiatric conditions across the board. So it doesn't matter if it's anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder or schizophrenia, early trauma is a common risk factor. And serotonin being such a critical neurotransmitter that influences mood, it's not very surprising to imagine that serotonin may contribute. And so that idea has been around for a while. What we stumbled upon in a sense was the idea that one of the serotonin receptors, the 5-HT2A receptor or the serotonin 2A receptor, its function is altered associated with early stress. We found this uh, rather interestingly because more often than not people look at levels of the receptor changing. Levels of the receptor don't change in many models of early adversity but the function of this receptor changes quite drastically. And you ended up with heightened or enhanced function that often is seen across the entire lifespan after events of early trauma. So we were able to show that. We were also able to show that if you simply enhance signaling through this receptor, you can actually mimic the effects of early trauma and evoke conditions like anxiety-like behavior and despair-like behavior in rodent models. And so that tells us that this particular receptor of serotonin plays a central role in mediating the effects of early trauma in shaping adult behavior. And also is a very interesting target for drugs that can be used to treat these conditions in, in human conditions of depression and anxiety. This is an example of how serendipity happens in science. Sometimes you're just sitting around with a bunch of people shooting the breeze. And we were just sitting around talking about uh, compounds that might exert neuroprotective actions. Neurons are the longest lived cells we have in our body. They're the cells that hang around with us our entire lifespan. And so they require to be healthy and optimally functioning for a very, very long time. Unlike other cells which can simply replace themselves, right? Um, and all neurons, they eat up about 20% of your energy requirement in a day. So whatever food you consume in a day, 20% of it is going to keep your neurons fully functioning. So they are very energy hungry and highly energy demanding. And because of that, they need optimal functioning mitochondria. So one way you can think of mitochondria is like it's your power station, right? So if you're a big city and you're running a big city and your power plants fail, then you can't run your city. Much the same way, your brain will not work if your power plants shut down and you need optimal functioning power plants. So we actually just decided that we would look at serotonin, partly because my lab has been working with serotonin for more than two decades now. And we just said, let's see what serotonin does to mitochondria. We discovered that serotonin robustly increases mitochondria, both their biogenesis, which is the production of these power plants and their function. Psychedelics have been known from indigenous knowledge for more than 10,000 years to be used by civilizations across the world as a way to alter consciousness. They have emerged in the last decade as extremely interesting molecules that can also impact the brain quite drastically as far as mood-related behavior is concerned, impacting and reducing anxiety and re reducing depression-like symptoms and also perhaps helping individuals who have post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is emerging from the clinic. We understand this already, that these are very interesting molecules. And if we can tweak them and use them appropriately in the right conditions, they might become very powerful therapies going forward. Certainly, that's what we see. What we've found is that serotonergic psychedelics, especially those that hit the serotonin 2A receptor, actually drive up the production of mitochondria quite drastically and enhance mitochondrial function. 
This now opens up the idea that serotonergic psychedelics may exert neuroprotective effects by actually modulating energy production and boosting mitochondria. It also opens up the possibility that these might be the ways via which these compounds, serotonergic psychedelics, actually improve mood and alter anxiety as well. This is still untapped, unknown, but the discovery points us in that direction and that's where we need to go collectively to figure out can we tap this to design better drugs that very selectively improve mood and anxiety but do not cause the effects on altered consciousness or perception that these compounds also have. So yeah, it's a vibrant community with lots of young researchers and postdoctoral fellows who definitely work, uh, you know, and are excited by the ideas of neuroscience. Neuropsychopharmacology would be the subset of neuroscience that I work on and certainly it's a rich, vibrant community. Now the question of do we have enough for our youngest people to get them excited to hang in there with science? I think especially in the Indian context, we have to realize that the bulk of the work, the creative work, the work in the laboratory actually comes from the graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. They are our greatest and most important intellectual resource. Their funding, their future, if we prioritize it, then Indian science will thrive and grow. Currently, that remains still a challenge in the country. And I hope that will get resolved. Because if we do have these kinds of aspirations to become a scientific powerhouse, then the future is the young people. It's our young graduate students, it's our postdoctoral fellows who will shape Indian science in the years to come. I'd like to say a deep appreciation for those who choose to do it despite challenging circumstances. And also that hopefully we will be able to improve our scientific ecosystems such that they become the priority going forward. When I heard that I had won the Infosys Prize, I was first most acutely concerned about the location that I was in because it was an utter surprise. I was at a music concert. There was a lot of disturbance and noise and I was a bit concerned that I did not sound remotely coherent. I wanted to indicate how happy and honored I was that my team's work was being recognized. But I was more concerned that there was, you know, belting of music in the background. So it was truly a moment of utter surprise. I didn't anticipate it at all. Now, when it comes to what do prizes like this do in terms of mattering for the research journey? While none of us really work or start our work with the expectation of a recognition or an award or a prize or even the journal that it's going to get published in, it's just the work that drives us. There's no question that having the recognition of the community at large, public, the Infosys Science Foundation is deeply meaningful because it takes our work to a wider platform. This is in a way taking the world work out of the lab into the real world in a sense. It's also a real boost to the research team. It's not just work that I have been associated with at all. This is the work that's been produced by a large bunch of people, wonderful graduate students, amazing postdocs. It is special. It's special because it matters to you in a sense that the work is being valued by the community.